Hi, I'm Darren from Isotonic Studios. Over the past few months, we've been working with Live 10 and the version of Max for Live that ships with Live 10. It came with a few new API calls and some additional features. So whilst we've been releasing some great new products from other members of our collective, we've taken some time to look at our back catalog and we're gonna be working through updating uh, many of our devices to the new Live 10 standard. We thought we'd start off with our most popular product, which is a, a device called Follow. Now Follow provides you with the ability to create automatic follow actions based on a variety of different triggers and those follow actions can be used to either trigger a clip or a scene. Over the next few videos, we're gonna show you firstly the concept of how it works and the functionality of it. We're then gonna dive a little bit deeper into the options that are available for the trigger type and for the follow actions. The final video in the series will show you how to control it in a live situation. That's either by MIDI, using the Push 2 and some of the new features that we've got with regards to the Push 2 screen, and importantly, via clip envelope. So you can set your set going in session view, let it run, and then interact with the follow device so that you can add that bit of spontaneity back to your performance and not get accused of just pressing play. We're gonna kick off looking at the device. Let's have a look. Okay, so the device itself is a Max for Live device. When you download it, our advice is to save it somewhere within your hard drive, go to places, add a folder, and basically add the folder where you store your Max for Live devices. That way you can access it through the, the Push uh, 2 browser. And of course, you've got those specific Max for Live devices available to use at any point. Now, Follow works on a very simple principle it creates follow actions without you having to set them yourself. So if we look at a clip, for example, uh, I've got a clip here which has a length of exactly two bars. And what will happen, the follow device will basically read the clip that is playing on the track that it, it sits. And at roughly 1 16th prior to the end of the clip, it will trigger whatever you've chosen as the desired follow action. Now it's 1 16th before because max for live runs on a low priority thread. So what you want is a little bit of time for your computer to breathe, to think about what it's gonna do next, and to ensure that there's no gaps in your performance. Now, as a result of that, we would recommend playing around with your clip launch quantization. Whilst it will work down to a 16th on a set that I've got here, uh, which is simply eight audio tracks, if you're playing stuff at 300 beats per minute, you've got MIDI tracks that are triggering VSTs and the like, your CPU is gonna be under a little bit more pressure. So what we would suggest is increasing the clip launch quantization, and in fact, increasing the trigger time. Now the trigger time element, what that does is effectively where normally it will trigger it at a 16th prior to the end of the clip, if that's your chosen follow action, increasing the trigger time will actually bring that trigger earlier. Now you could bring it quite a lot earlier, maybe 30, 40, 50 on the uh, trigger time, but you'd need to compensate that by having a higher quantize action because it's going to trigger it early and you don't want to miss the end of your clips. We've left it as a trigger time that's adjustable for every setup so once you've got it set pretty much you can just forget it. Now there's realistically three areas to the device itself and what I've got is the follow scene device and the principles that I'm going to cover within the follow scene device apply exactly to the follow clip device. The only difference between the two, follow scene will trigger a scene, which can include the, the name of the scene, which might include a BPM change. If you're using ClipX Pro, it could include an X scene, so it could have a trigger for one of your action lists, for example. The follow clip version will launch the clips and the tracks, so it won't affect the scene, it won't affect other tracks. Now the advice is to only have one copy of follow scene in your set as more than one copy may conflict. Uh, they're both gonna send messages at the same time, etc. 
But if you're using follow clip, then you can have one in every track quite happily. So I'm gonna run through very quickly what the layout of the device is. Um, working from left to right, it's quite a logical uh, progression is you have the trigger type. So what is the event that's actually gonna cause the next action, whatever that is chosen to be, to fire? And we're gonna go through these in some detail in the next video, but very simply put, one will trigger at clip end, one will enable you to bypass the looping that's on the, the clip, because if a, a clip's looping, it will never end. You also have the option of time, which is designed to trigger the next clip at a certain point in hours, minutes, and seconds, specifically designed for unwarped clips. And then finally, you have clip stop. And that was originally intended to define a clip that you were gonna trigger and reset, say, a set of macros using a dummy clip or, or something along those uh, bases. The trigger time we've covered, which enables you to fine tune the device to your particular setup and CPU processing power. And then we move into the second section. Here we define the follow action type, and we've got two ways of doing this. We've got a list in a live menu, which allows you to set it via clip envelope. So you can actually draw that into a particular clip and as it moves through the set, pick up a new clip envelope and have different follow actions for each individual clip. The other way of changing the follow action is actually by these set of 10 buttons. Now, as you can see, as I click on that, it will change the master follow action and we can work through all of those. Now, the reason for those being individual is they are individually MIDI mappable. So you can actually, with a, a couple of buttons, define your favorite follow actions and realistically be able to work through a set in that nature. We've got some buttons over here which are quite niftily color coded. Green, very simply put, like a traffic light means go. So whatever is detailed in the name of that button, as soon as you press it or indeed trigger it via MIDI, it will launch that scene or indeed clip. It's reading the current one or i.e. the last one that has been played. So that's a, a way of simply repeating that scene as you want it to. It will observe the global or the clip quantization. The next one is the follow action scene. So defined by what your follow action is and the last scene I pay, played and as you can tell in this set, we're stress testing it. So I've got 1,126 scenes. So the next one would obviously be 1,127. Whereas the previous would be 1,125. You get the drift. So effectively, as soon as I click that, it will wait for the next global launch quantization or the clip launch quantization and then go for it. The next options are realistically in orange. Now, if I change, so I highlight a different scene, what that enables me to do is click the button. Again, MIDI map is available. And from there, it will change the follow action to chosen. And what that allows you to do is queue up the next clip or scene that will follow on after your current clip reaches the trigger type that you've defined. So it's a way of in advance deciding where you're gonna go next, but not doing it immediately, waiting until the next point. Now we've got an option here which uh, hooks our device up to our launch sync device, which we'll cover in a separate window. And in addition, we have a floating window, which gives you a, a much larger display of the current action, what's currently playing, what will play next, and then the cue for the next trigger. Now we've already covered the highlighted version and this window is, is set to be on top. So if I click anywhere within the set, then it's not gonna lose focus. But if I change that to not be on top anymore, it'll disappear when I click away. So that leaves the final part, which is called clips, cues from clip name. Now effectively, I've, uh, I've defined and, and named these scenes right, rather randomly, Groove Army, Delicious, Danny, The, Keith, Brian, Nunn and Brina, which is Brian spelt wrong. And within the clip names, what I've got is the clip name itself, 
then in capital letters FA, standing for follow action, and then the name of the scene, arguably also clip on the follow clip device, that I want to populate this drop down list. Now, the drop down list effectively has the names of every scene within the set, and that's populated when you save, close, and reopen your set. It would also work if I clicked and clicked again the isotonic logo. However, it's not advised. Uh, we've got it on clip stop there. It's not advised because what you're re actually doing is you're rewriting the names of automation lines in live. Now that's fine to do as the set starts because you're writing them all at the same time. So it's with caution that if you change the name of tracks, move clips around, etc., that you updated those menus whilst you've got live effectively open. What you'll have seen then is as that clip was triggered, it will automatically take the names that have been written and it will write them to the cues from the clip name and that gives me the ability to say, well, I'll MIDI map Keith as it shows there. So when this clip actually gets triggered, which it won't do whilst looping is on in this particular mode, it will launch the Keith. Let's give that a go. There you go. So lots of different options that we've got there and we'll dive into them in a little bit more detail explaining all the options that are available in the next video. Thanks for watching.